Good morning. I'm Sam Ford, a reporter with Channel 7 who covers Washington, D.C., and I'm your MC today. Also, I'd like to tell you that the uh, wonderful music you heard as you were uh, coming in was from Benjamin Gates, a cellist from Duke Ellington High School. Would you all please stand for the presentation of the colors? All right, those young people, you may be seated. Those young people are from the DC Youth Challenge Academy at Oak Hill, and I thought they did a wonderful job. Also, doing a wonderful job, Ms. Carol, uh, Carolyn Malachi. I mean, to hear the national anthem like that. I mean, that was absolutely wonderful. And you're going to hear more of her while we are eating breakfast. Next, we're going to hear from the Reverend Thomas Bowen with the invocation.
Good morning. As I now try to compose myself, let us pray. Let us pray. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you not only for emancipation, but for the suffrage. Mr. Lincoln may have read, but you are the one who set us free. We are an imperfect people, but with our imperfections, perfect our will. Emancipation perfected our union, yet without D.C. statehood, we are imperfect. Without it, we can never be great. Help us to transact the unfinished business of our democracy. Teach us like you taught Frederick Douglass to pray with our hands and our feet. Teach us like Harriet Tubman taught us not to stop until all those under our charge are safe and free. Our resistance, Lord, is rooted in the belief that no weapon formed against us shall prosper and that there is a God who rules and super rules. Now, Lord, bless the food that we're about to receive and all those who rose early this morning to prepare and serve but will not have the opportunity to sit down to enjoy it. In the name of the one who is holy and whose name is thankfully above all other names up and down the avenue, that name, that precious name, amen. amen. And so breakfast is served. We'll be back later. So we've been told and some choose to believe it I know they're all wait and see Someday we'll find it The rainbow connection The lovers, the dreamers and me So many songs about rainbows and words on the other side. Visions, only illusions, and rainbows and nothing to hide. Soon we've been told. 
choose to believe it. I know they're wrong, wait and see. Someday we'll find it, the rainbow connection, the lovers, the dreamers, and me. Thank you all for being here this morning. Thanks to the mayor for having us. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven rings. Ring with the harmonies of land.
Well, we're going to go on with the program. Um, first up, Mrs. Carolyn Malachi, wasn't she great? <laughs> and it's good to see that you're all here. Uh, after yesterday, I thought, I thought I was back in Kansas again, you know, with that storm blew through here. You know, we'd have to, at home, we'd duck down. And <laughs> although we didn't have the thunder that, you know, in Kansas, everybody's religious when you hear that thunder, you know, you... You think God is coming for you. Anyway, we're going to continue the uh, program with Council Member Brandon Todd, um, Chairman of the Government Operations Committee, to give greetings. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sam, for that introduction. My name is Brandon Todd, and I represent Ward 4 on the D.C. Council. And I am the chairman of the Council's Committee on Government Operations. Good morning to Mayor Bowser and her cabinet, Chairman Phil Mendelson, and my colleagues on the D.C. Council, Senator Chris Van Hollen, Lauren Vaughn, Secretary of the District of Columbia, and other elected officials present. Uh, as chairman of the Council's Committee on Government Operations, which now oversees the Emancipation Day celebrations, it is such a pleasure to be here with you to commemorate D.C. Emancipation. Day. And of course, we are also here to reaffirm our commitment to work towards a shared goal of statehood for the District of Columbia. Thank you to Mayor Bowser for your push for statehood and shining a light on the District of Columbia's quest to be the 51st state. As a lifelong D.C. resident, Emancipation Day will always have a special place in my heart. I expect we all eagerly await the Emancipation Day parade 
fireworks and festivities this year, just like every year. It is part of what makes the District of Columbia such a unique and wonderful place worthy of being a 50, the 51st state. As chairman of the DC Council's Committee on Government Operations, I would like to congratulate the new DC Emancipation Commission members. Let's give them a round of applause and also thank Secretary Lauren Vaughn for chairing the Emancipation Day Commission and everything that you and your staff have done to make today's breakfast wonderful. We have so much to be proud for in the city of Washington, D.C., and I look forward to fighting the good fight with all of you. Thank you for being here this morning. And of course, our next speaker needs no introduction, but uh, we're going to do it anyway. It's Mayor Bowser, and uh, she's been busy this week. I've been busy running around after her. She was there with the uh, council presenting her budget one day this week. I saw her out on the street with some kind of thing stamping down asphalt as the Pothole Palooza campaign went. And of course, yesterday, she was out there with storm damage. Our Mayor, Muriel Bowser. Well, good morning, everybody. It is wonderful to be here to commemorate Emancipation Day in the District of Columbia and to celebrate the progress that we've made in actually being emancipated in the District of Columbia. So I want to welcome you to this Emancipation Day and Full Democracy Breakfast. Uh, we have spent many years having this breakfast down at the Willard, and I want to congratulate uh, Senior Advisor Perry and her team for a lovely new location. So give them a big round of applause. I am also very happy uh, that we have been joined by members of the council he who are here. You're going to get a chance to uh, see and hear from a council member and chairman Phil Mendelson. Where's Phil Mendelson? Give him a big round of applause right here in the front. And uh, Chairman Todd, we appreciate uh, Chairman's leadership in working with us on statehood activities. I also would like to acknowledge Councilwoman Bonds right in the middle, <laughs> Council Member Jack Evans right here, Councilwoman Mary Che, <laughs> Council Member Robert White was here, <laughs> Council Member Kenya McDuffie who I think is here, there he is right there, and uh, we've also been joined by Attorney General Carl Racine. And uh, I've been joined by my mother, Joan Bowser, so I want to give her a big round of applause. And we, we have invited a very, oh, and Council Member Brianne Nadeau from Ward 1. Thank you, Council Member Nadeau and Ward 1 residents. Uh, and we have been joined by a fierce uh, champion for us and for all Americans, and he happens to be our neighbor from Maryland. And we've gotten to know Chris Van Hollen very well, and he's going to be a champion for full democracy when he delivers his marks in just a few minutes. Give Chris Van Hollen a big round of applause. So you know why we're here. Last year when we had this breakfast, we set out a big goal for ourselves. Uh, we said that we would chart a new course towards statehood. Decades and decades we've been working. Where are all of our champions for D.C. statehood that have been working for D.C. statehood for decades in Washington, D.C.? Raise your hands. Give them a big round of applause. All of our statehood advocates who've been working. And so last year, together with a huge goal of putting the question of statehood on the ballot and following the Tennessee plan, we really gathered all of our forces to work together to advance the cause. So last April, we said we would put it on the ballot. We knew it was a huge task. We knew we would have to work hard to educate our public, to get their input, and also to draft a new constitution and new boundaries, 
gather a legal team who put their great minds together with our advocates and our staff, and that's exactly what we were able to do. We were able to convene a constitutional convention. The council was able to uh, look at that constitution, and the voters were able to agree that this is a constitution that could guide our new state. Here are our boundaries. We still have our federal district, but then we have the 51st state of Washington, D.C., where all of us live. And then lo and behold, Beverly and I said, we are we're kind of trying to handicap what the vote would be. And you know what we said as our mark? Initiative 71. If we could get more votes than marijuana, we knew we were doing something. <laughs> and that is what we were able to do. Over 80% of Washingtonians came out and voted for statehood for Washington, D.C. But more importantly, what they did with those votes uh, was to say uh, that we have to keep doing something differently. And I used it as a watermark that if the people came out and got behind us, then that we would be able to go to the council and go to all of our taxpayers and say, less fun national and local public education activities. And so that is the type of work that we need to continue to do. I want to acknowledge and thank our, our congressional delegation, our Congresswoman, of course, and also our Senators Brown, who I think is here, and, and Senator Strauss, who are, Senator Strauss is right there, and our Representative Garcia. Please give them a big round of applause as well because they fight every day uh, to advance the cause of statehood for us in our neighborhoods, uh, but also uh, in their work and lobbying the Congress. So we appreciate the work uh, that they do. So we would invite and continue to have conversations uh, with you about how we will advance our very targeted national activities uh, to educate our fellow Americans about the very unjust situation where we live. I advanced yesterday to the council our budget, $13 billion budget. Uh, and it, it was, that's good, right? But you know what's even better, Judge? It's balanced. And it invests in the priorities that we set out together. And one of those items uh, is to allow us to fund a nearly million dollar statehood campaign to educate our fellow Americans. So I hope that you will support us in that. But now it brings me great pleasure to introduce um, our speaker this morning. Senator Christopher Van Hollen has been a long and distinguished public servant and he has a great uh, record of success. He was elected to the United States Senate in 2016 uh, and he has taken the seat of a, another mighty Maryland Senator, Barbara Mikulski. Before joining the Senate, he served 14 years in the House of Representatives serving the people of Maryland's 8th District. He has proven to be a reliable friend to us here in the District of Columbia. Senator Van Hollen has voted to support D.C. autonomy over and over again, and he will help us continue to maintain um, that autonomy. He voted in the House for the Voting Rights Act to give D.C. a vote in the House and has long been a co-sponsor of the Admissions Act. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Senator Christopher Van Hollen. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you, uh, Mayor Bowser. Thank you for that uh, warm introduction, that neighborly introduction. Thank you for your great leadership uh, here in the District of Columbia. And I know that you've submitted a budget uh, recently, and I can tell you that compared to the budgets on Capitol Hill, which are totally out of balance and always in the red, uh, it's very refreshing to see the kind of budget that you submitted. So let's give the mayor a big round of applause to the 
chair of the council, Phil Mendelson, uh, and all your colleagues, uh, Brandon Tan and others, uh, thank you for the leadership uh, that you provide. And I have to say, as someone from neighboring Maryland, I've always taken the view that in order for this whole region to be strong and vibrant and dynamic, economically and socially uh, and in every way, uh, we need a very strong District of Columbia. And so uh, I look forward to working with all of you. Uh, I had my own early negotiation right after my election uh, with someone called Chuck Schumer. I really wanted to get on the Appropriations uh, Committee, uh, and I'm pleased to say that was a successful negotiation. Uh, and I look forward to working uh, with all of you here in the District of Columbia uh, because I believe that it's so important that we all uh, work together in this region. And of course, we would be even stronger if we really followed through on what we're celebrating here today. Of course, we're celebrating Emancipation Day, but we're celebrating it as we look to the future and saying, let's have full democracy. Full democracy for the people of the District of Columbia, because really that's what's necessary to make sure that the people of the district and the district can achieve all of that potential. And I look forward to working with you, uh, not only to make sure that your representative in Congress has full voting rights, but that we make sure that D.C., the District of Columbia, can be the state of Columbia. So I um, look forward to working with you on that. It really is a national scandal. It's a national scandal that the oldest and greatest democracy on earth does not have full voting rights for federal offices here in our nation's capital. And I have to salute your fighter in Congress today, Eleanor Holmes Norton. I was so proud to work with her, work with her, and she's a fighter on every issue. But I always thought to myself and told her and said how wrong it was that she can get out there every day, debate on the floor of the House of Representatives, fight for the people of the District of Columbia, but when it comes right down to it, could not cast a vote uh, on behalf of the people of the District of Columbia. That is simply wrong. And we need to change that, and we also need to make sure in the process that you have two voting senators in the United States Senate. You know, if you drive out any of these major avenues, Pennsylvania Avenue, Georgia Avenue, Connecticut Avenue, and you cross from the District of Columbia into Maryland, all of a sudden you go from somebody who lives on the District of Columbia side of the line not having somebody in the House that can cast a vote for them and not having two senators. And that's just, a, that's just an arbitrary line. And yet, the differences are profound, and the differences result in a great injustice. And it was really great to see the people of the District of Columbia come out in large numbers on November 8th, over 80% of the vote for statehood here in the District of Columbia. As the mayor said, uh, the benchmark, I guess, was the, the marijuana resolution, so it's all it's very fitting that the vote was much higher for, um, sorry about that. <laughs> you know, somebody joked after the last presidential election in the, you know, there was a lot of despair in many quarters, speaking for myself anyway, and speaking for myself anyway. And um, somebody said, there were also these referendum on marijuana in Massachusetts. And someone said, you know, it just goes to show when they go low, we really do go high. <laughs> Anyway, that's small consolation. Uh, let me just say this. The District of Columbia has more people in it than the state of Wyoming. It has more people in it than the state of Vermont. And yet, each of those states not only has one member of 
the House of Representatives, they also have two voting senators. And you also have to consider the fact, and you know this because it's right there on the license plate, that the people of the District of Columbia pay more taxes per capita than the people in any other state in the country. Federal taxes. And yet you do not have someone in Congress in the House or the Senate who can vote on the Appropriations Committee as to how your tax dollars should be invested and allocated. So what really burns me up, what really burns me up on this is when I'm sitting next to some of my colleagues and they're traveling around the world. They're going to places where, you know, people do not have full voting rights, countries where we're urging their leaders to, and the people to allow greater freedom and greater democracy and voting rights around the world. And I'm glad they're doing that. But at the same time, they come back from lecturing people overseas about democracy and come back here in the Congress and vote to overturn decisions made by the people of the District of Columbia. That is wrong. That is wrong, and that's hypocrisy. It's also incredibly hypocritical for people to say, we want decision-making power to be more localized. You know, the people closest to the voters, the representatives closest to the people, are the people who should be making the decisions. That's the philosophy that many have, and I, I support the notion that on many things we need to have local decision-making, we need state decision-making, we need federal decision-making. But we have a lot of colleagues who, when we're talking about setting federal policy, they say, no, you can't do that. The federal government should do that. That's got to be a decision made by the representatives who are closest to the people. And yet, whenever the District of Columbia and the people of the District of Columbia vote for something that they don't like, they are there to try to overturn it. And since the beginning of this session of Congress, just since early January, we've seen bills introduced in the United States Congress to overturn the D.C. Death with Dignity legislation. We've seen another effort, as we do every year, every Congress, to overturn the common sense gun safety rules in the District of Columbia. And we've seen bills introduced that would protect, prohibit the District of Columbia from using its own revenues to provide all women with the full range of reproductive choice. We've seen those introduced already. Now, in the past, we've also seen them work to overturn some of the immigration policies proposed by the District of Columbia, labor policies introduced by the District of Columbia, and education policies introduced by the District of Columbia. You have to wonder what's going on in somebody's head when they say they're in favor of local decision making and yet they want to impose their own views on the people of the District of Columbia. And we need to continue to shine a light on that hypocrisy and that total contradiction in positions. You know, Jason Chavitz, uh, uh, Jason Chavitz, you know, I've worked with him on some issues, and I always say, Jason, why are you, why are you doing this? Well, everybody here will have an opportunity in some way to weigh in uh, on that election back home. But I think that I think it's really important that we we begin to really sharpen our messages um, about the hypocrisy here, because what you're seeing is so many members of Congress who get frustrated they can't do something at the federal level, and they decide to use the District of Columbia as their sort of policy plaything and try to impose their ideas on the people of District of Columbia when they cannot successfully do that in the Congress of the United States. So, you know, I've taken to, you know, saying to my colleagues, look, if you, if you want to, if you really want to 
play this game, go back home and tell people there that this is what you want. Don't do it here in the District of Columbia. And I've taken to calling them really the, the Putins of the Potomac around here because um, I want to let me just say that I'm going to join with Tom Carper, senator from Delaware, uh, right after Congress reconvenes to introduce the legislation for statehood for the District of Columbia. And we're going to work together to rally, to rally people around the country to get this done. And I sh will just say this, voting rights for the people of District of Columbia and D.C. statehood is one part of our larger fight around the country for voting rights. Y yesterday in the United States Senate, uh, we had a big debate. We had the debate on the nomination of the next Supreme Court justice uh, to the highest court uh, in the land. And, you know, people should look at the record and they should decide how they want to vote. In my view, though, it was a big mistake to change the voting rules in the United States Senate uh, for the Supreme Court justice. Because, because we have a rule in the Senate that essentially requires that 60 out of 100 senators support the nomination of a Supreme Court justice. And the reason for that rule is clear, because it's really important that somebody who's going to have a lifetime appointment to the highest court in the land and make decisions that will influence the direction of our country for generations to come be able to at least pull together a consensus of 60 votes, not, a, not just 51, but a consensus of 60 votes. That's the reason for that rule, because we know that whoever will be there may be casting critical decisions for the future of our country. And we've seen a lot of five to four decisions in recent years, some of them good, some very bad. For example, the Shelby decision, which took a big bite out of the Voting Rights Act, was decided on a five to four vote. And that's just one very powerful illustration of the fact that any one of those nine Supreme Court justices can change the trajectory of our democracy. We also saw a 5-4 decision in Citizens United. So it was very disheartening and alarming to see that so-called nuclear option being exercised yesterday, and the vote will come today. But I only raise that because we're here really talking fundamentally about democracy and voting rights for the District of Columbia and the right of statehood. And it's also part of a larger conversation in our country about making sure that uh, we have easy access to the ballot uh, for everybody who has the right to vote. It should not just be a theoretical right. It needs to be something that's real. Now, here in the District of Columbia, you're not putting up direct barriers to voting. Of course, the Congress has put up barriers uh, by not allowing voting rights for the representative from the District of Columbia. Uh, but elsewhere in the country, there are lots of legislators uh, and state legislatures uh, that are trying to put up barriers to voting. So this is uh, this is an initiative that we all need to take together. But in the greatest democracy on earth, a lot of this should begin here, right here at home. And if we're going to we are the greatest democracy of the world, in the world, but if we're really going to live up to that principle and that standard, let's start right here at home. Let's make sure we have full statehood for the District of Columbia, and I will be proud to represent the state of Maryland with the neighboring state right here. Thank you all very much for what you're doing.
Thank you, Senator. And now we're going to hear from the chairman. Thanks, Sam. Thank you for that very long and uh, eloquent introduction. <laughs> Actually, if you know me, I kind of prefer brevity when it comes to introductions. Uh, I'm going to begin on a sobering note. A couple of uh, my colleagues are not here this morning uh, because there's a memorial service for a former colleague, Sharon Ambrose, who passed away last weekend. And I think it might be appropriate if we take just a few moments, seconds of uh, silence to remember Sharon. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to begin by uh, repeating what the mayor said and introducing some of um, our colleagues, and I don't have it in any particular order. Uh, At-large Councilmember Robert White, Ward 4 Councilmember Brandon Todd, Ward 1 Councilmember Brianne Nadeau, Ward 3 Councilmember Mary Che, At-large Councilmember Anita Bonds, Ward 2 Councilmember Jack Evans, Ward 5 Councilmember Kenyon McDuffie. I don't believe I missed anyone. Uh, so I want to thank my colleagues for being here, and I also want to acknowledge, as the mayor did as well, our attorney general, our elected attorney general, Carl Racine, and our shadow delegation, whom I wish, I think we all wish, were not called the shadow delegation, Senators Brown, Strauss, and, uh, and the representative. And I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name at the moment, and that's, uh, yeah, Franklin Garcia. We do that sometimes when we've been in office a while, as we forget. And I want to thank very much Senator Van Hollen, not only for your words, but also for your support for the district. Uh, I'm going to try to be fairly brief because some of us need to get out of here to get to the memorial service. Um, yesterday, as I was leaving the Wilson building, I uh, came down the steps and walked past a memorial that's on the first floor that most people don't really see or spend much time looking at. And it's a memorial to District of Columbia government workers who left their jobs to serve this country in World War I and gave their lives to the country. And uh, of course, it's not hard for any of us in this room to make the connection that we give our citizens in the battles of the United States of America. And yet we do not have the full citizenship that uh, the citizens of the states have. And really, that's what that's about today, is that and we've done this over the last uh, number of years. And that reminds me, I forgot to acknowledge former council members who are here, Frank Smith, Yvette Alexander, and uh, Vincent Orange. And I interrupt to do that because Vincent Orange, of course, was the energy behind the district declaring Emancipation Day a holiday. And what was the emancipation on April 16th, 1862? It was about citizenship. Even though, as we know, for several years it wasn't clear under the law that African Americans would have the right to vote until the uh, 13th Amendment. But still, that's what emancipation is about, is about citizenship. And so today is an opportunity, and next weekend as we get to the holiday, an opportunity, actually a duty for those, in the, duty for those of us in the district to reflect on full citizenship and to try to remind our fellow citizens across the country that full citizenship means full voting rights and full representation in the Congress of the United States. Congress granted us in 1974, yes, granted us, home rule. It was limited home rule. And I've said to folks in recent years, it was like purgatory. It's great that we have something. Yeah, you know, sort of like half heaven and half hell, but it's really not either. Um, and I mean this seriously because we didn't get full home rule. They reserved to themselves a number of powers and authority over the District of Columbia. For example, and this is just a small example, but it's kind of obvious, um, we cannot determine the salary of our chief financial officer, who's an important person. Well, we can determine the salary of the chief of police, and our chief is here this morning, um, <laughs> Pete Newsham. Uh, we can determine the salary of the president of the University of the District of Columbia. Um, we can determine the salary of the city administrator and the mayor. And these folks are arguably more important. Um, but we can't determine the salary of the uh, chief financial officer, and that's because Congress reserved that to itself. And Congress in 1974 had these committees that were uh, dealt exclusively with the District of Columbia. They kind of ran the city, which we didn't like, and they didn't do a good job of it. 
But it was from that context that they reserved these rights and didn't give them to us. Well, we're doing a pretty good job running the city. The mayor and I and Jack Evans were... The mayor and I and Jack Evans and the chief financial officer were in, uh, at Wall Street uh, earlier, actually it was last month, and we have may, arguably the best picture to tell of any jurisdiction in the country. I'm not going to compare us to the federal government, which can't pass its budgets or balance budgets, but other states. We have a fully funded pension. We have a fully funded other post-employment benef post benefits program, which most people have not heard of, but it is a liability in most jurisdictions. We have reserves approaching 60 days operating costs. I mean, very few jurisdictions have any one of those, let alone all three and not just balanced budgets, but uh, surpluses. Uh, we're doing a very, very good job. And yet we cannot fully control the operation of our city because Congress reserved those to itself. The other day I was talking to a, a member of Congress and um, I said to him, what about budget autonomy? And his answer was, I support budget autonomy. I think you should have budget autonomy. You're doing a better job than the Congress is in running the fiscal affairs of the city. But I'll give you, I'll support budget autonomy when you repeal all those social, uh, all that social legislation. It's just a very different set of values. And as Senator, as the Senator said, you know, when you think about some of the principles that politicians espouse, which is that, you know, really there should be local control over local values. Why should members of Congress be telling us what are, where we should be on social issues? And yet that's what they do. Nowhere in the Federalist Papers will you see any reference that it was the intent of the Founding Fathers to take away our representation. And in fact, for until 1801, so what does that add up to? 13, 14 years? We had representation in Congress. Yes, citizens of the District of Columbia were able to vote for members of Congress. Um, the Federalist Paper does not say that should be taken away. That was not their intent at all. Their intent was to protect the federal interest uh, but weighing in on our, our, where we are on social issues is not a federal interest, not at all. On January 20th, I had difficulty being here in the District of Columbia, so I went to Mexico City. And why do I mention that? Because Mexico, in its 1910 revolution, adopted a constitution, and it modeled it to some extent after the Constitution of the United States, and they created a federal district where their national capital is. But they did give the citizens of the national capital uh, the right to vote for folks in, in uh, the national legislature. Um, but most recently, as in just the last couple of years, the federal government of Mexico decided to go further and it granted statehood to the federal district. Why can't we do that here? We are the only capital of a, of a free country on this planet, on this planet, where the citizens of the national capital do not have representatives they can vote for in the Congress, in the national legislature, the only one. And the only way we're gonna solve this, where we have full control over our social issues, our policies, our government, and have full representation in Congress is with statehood. So that's what we should be reflecting on. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, now we're going to give a brief introduction to the mayor. Next steps for democracy, and she will have the last word. And uh, after that, you are dismissed. Mayor Bowser. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Chairman, thank you for, for those words. And my task now is just to be a little bit more specific about our, our next steps. And so, like Senator Van Hollen is our, our good friend, uh, our job now is to find more good friends like the senator. Uh, and until our quest is completed, we, we know that we have a lot of public education to do. We know that we must garner the support from mayors and from governors across our country to build our support in Congress. So that is what our effort that we'll fund with this budget is aimed toward doing. Uh, Beverly and her team have identified 10 states and analyzed their demographics uh, and other data that give us the idea that these are the 10 states we should talk to first. Uh, we, of course, would like to get feedback uh, and have you weigh in on those decisions. 
We will seek to tap sitting governors and mayor's networks um, that we're already involved in. Uh, we would like to identify businesses and stakeholders from across the country and uh, work with their Washington, D.C. offices. We will also evaluate the congressional delegations for those targeted states, uh, and that's how we're going to begin to chart the course. Uh, we, of course, need your energy and strategy and your connections, too. Uh, just if we go around this room, around all these tables, I bet that we can come up with a lot of those business and political networks in those targeted states. So we uh, are counting on you to call on your friends and neighbors from around the 50 states. Does anybody know somebody who lives in a state outside of Maryland? <laughs> right? Some of you went to colleges outside of the DMV and you have huge alumni networks, for example, right? Uh, and so these are the types of uh, ideas that I want you churning because that's what we need to do uh, to raise our profile in those states and to tap in the, to the very serious networks in those targeted states. So we will begin to grow the numbers of senators uh, and on both sides, right? because that's what it takes. You heard the senator talk about uh, the real danger of a polarized uh, Senate. But I'll just say this, for us, this has never been a Democratic or Republican issue. Statehood is an American issue. Um, and it's an issue uh, that everybody who cares about uh, the value of people who are taxed being represented uh, in their legislature should care about it. And we know that our Republican friends believe very strongly that the federal government shouldn't be running uh, the local lives of American citizens. And so we're going to hold them to that. And we are going to uh, pursue this strategy, whether uh, it be a Democrat or Republican. But we should not, uh, we should not uh, miss what we've heard today. Because this is, I'm, I'm not sure we've heard this before from a senator from Maryland. Support for D.C. statehood. And this is why it's so smart. Because why should our delegation only have six senators? It's good for Maryland if the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia delegation has eight senators. It's good for Virginia if we have eight senators. And I know it's good for us to have eight senators uh, between uh, our, I'm sorry, six. I can't count this morning. People are looking at me like eight. It would be even better to have eight. I get ahead of myself. <laughs> so we want to join the Senate delegation of four from the DMV and make it the Senate delegation of six from the DMV. And the people of Maryland can be assured um, because our values and the things that we want to deliver for our residents are so very similar um, that they can count on us just like uh, we've been able to count on them on so many issues. So God bless the District of Columbia. I want to thank all of our friends here at the Women's Museum. Isn't this a lovely way to start a morning? Give them, we want to give them appreciation and thanks as well and have a wonderful day.